uh, let me ask you, since you're talking about treatment, uh, Indian Council for Medical Research has actually cleared and even recommended the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine for high-risk uh, uh, people, people who may be at great risk of exposure, including health workers and household co uh, contacts of those with confirmed COVID cases, uh, Dr. Swaminathan. Now, the World Health Organization has not yet, as far as I know, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, taken a categorical position on the use of chloroquine or what in India at one point we used to know as quinine. Where does the WHO come in on this particular drug? That's a very important question, Barka, and it's not only about chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, but there are a number of other drugs um, that are uh, in the pipeline or that have been considered as potentially being effective against coronavirus, against this COVID-19. Obviously, I think WHO's topmost priority is to establish the evidence for the efficacy of any one of these uh, potential treatments because we want to save lives and we want to prevent people from getting the infection, healthcare workers and other high-risk groups, as you just mentioned. The problem is that today there is a lack of evidence on which we can make recommendations. There have been a lot of lab data generated, a lot of in vitro data showing that this drug and that drug would have potential efficacy against the virus. Now, that's a long way away from demonstrating that when you actually give it to people in the doses which can be tolerated by people, that it has an impact on any of the clinical outcomes. So we're not just interested in whether it kills the virus or reduces the viral load. We're also interested, more importantly, knowing whether it reduces mortality, whether it reduces hospitalization and the need for intensive care. Can it reduce the severity of illness? And if it's taken prophylactically, as has been suggested for chloroquine, does it reduce the risk of getting infected? Now, these questions can only be answered through well-designed research studies. And so what the WHO is saying is the need of the R today is to generate this evidence. And to do that, we brought together the world's leading scientists in February of this year. So within a few weeks of the outbreak starting, we had a big research and innovation forum where we outline what the key research questions are and the knowledge gaps are to encourage researchers around the world to, to answer those questions in a collaborative manner or you know within each country, but do it in a well-structured uh, way. And so based on that, we now have we're developing several protocols that we call solidarity protocols. And we are inviting countries to participate in these research studies. The first one to be launched this week is the protocol where we're testing four different drugs uh, for effectiveness uh, and safety in treating COVID-19 patients mm -hmm. of different severities with different comorbidities of different age groups. And what we're hoping is that in a couple of months, if many countries join, many hospitals join, we will have thousands of patients enrolled into this randomized clinical trial that will give us a definitive answer on whether any of these drugs, including chloroquine, including lopinavir, ritonavir, which you know is an anti-HIV drug that's also been proposed to be effective, remdesivir, which is an experimental drug, um, are, are they really effective? And, and what do they do? Do they reduce deaths? Do they reduce severity? When can they be used? What are the side effect profiles and so on? The other trials that are following very quickly is going to be the one for using chloroquine for healthcare worker and other high-risk group uh, prevention to, to be used as a preventive. And then we have a couple more uh, in the pipeline. So my suggestion to any country or any organization that is wanting to to um, protect people, obviously, I think that's high priority for national governments, is to do it in a framework of research, in a framework where you can collect the data and that it makes sense, it can be analyzed, and it can inform further guidance. Otherwise, we'll be, we might be in a situation where there's a shortage of all of these drugs. People are panic buying, and I can tell you that there have already been reports of two uh, cases of chloroquine poisoning from Nigeria. Uh, because there's this rush to, yeah. to buy chloroquine and, and start eating, having to, yeah. have, you know, to protect themselves. 
So, so but there you needs know, to be a very measured, uh, yeah, uh, but you know, evidence based, uh, I think, response. Uh, and if we can generate that data, that it can help to guide policy and practice in India, but also in other countries. Now, obviously, you're making a, a really good, good argument speaking as a scientist. But what's happening to doctors, uh, ma'am, who have to treat patients is that they're experimenting. They're trying all kinds of things. They're trying all kinds of combinations. And there's that sense that one doesn't have time. There's a, there's a panic in India and all over the world. Where do you officially come in on this kind of experimental use of, let's say, hydro hydroxychloroquine or the, you know, the HIV uh, sort of drugs or the azith azithromycin that has been used in combination with the chloroquine. Uh, we did read two, uh, two reports, one from France, one from China, saying the lab results were positive, but I think the French report was just on 36 people. I think the sample size was just too small. But in the absence of time for a proper trial and to await those results, what should doctors be doing according to the uh, WHO? I can understand the position of doctors and other healthcare workers, but you know what we need to do is what is known to work, which is using the right precautions at the right place when you're handling a particular type of patient, what we call universal precautions. And in this case, if you are, you know, if you're a person who's actually testing an individual, like putting in the swab, doing a throat or a nasal swab, you need a certain kind of protection. If you are in an outpatient setting, you need a certain kind of protection. If you are in an intensive care, critical care, where you're doing procedures on infected people, you need a much more uh, uh, a different level of protection. Those are known to work. Chloroquine may or may not work. I mean, let's hope that it works. But yeah. if it doesn't, people should not get a false sense of security that they are now protected because they're yeah. taking a medicine. So I think that's the other risk is that yeah. you think you're protected when in fact you may not be. And secondly, we shouldn't leave a focus on what is really needed. That's the personal protective equipment that yes. healthcare workers need. And so we need to also tell the public that they shouldn't be using the masks and the other yeah. equipment that are needed by the healthcare workers uh, who are in the clinics and in the hospitals treating patients. So I come back to the same message that we cannot make recommendations or encourage the use of any kind of interventions which do not have the scientific knowledge base. You mentioned two studies. Mm -hmm. Both of these were for treatment of patients, not prevention. And from what I've read of the literature, chloroquine has been tried in many other viral diseases previously because it has some effect in the lab and it has a theoretical basis for an antiviral effect, but it's never been shown to be effective against any other virus. Maybe we get lucky this time and it's effective against COVID-19. But we first need to demonstrate that 